In this lecture, we'll talk about eigenvectors and eigenvalues. The basic idea behind eigenvectors and eigenvalues is pretty simple. In this example, we take a matrix A, multiply it by a vector V, and what we happen to find is that in this case, what we get is a scalar multiple of V. Now that's fairly unusual. Most times when we multiply a matrix by a vector, we don't just get a multiple of the vector as a result of that operation, but sometimes we do. And when that happens, we have a special name for it. So we say that V is an eigenvector of the matrix A, and that negative four, the constant multiple, this number here, is an eigenvalue of that matrix A. Here's the formal definition. So when we have an n by n matrix A, a non-zero vector x is an eigenvector of A, if when we multiply the matrix A by x, what we get is lambda times x for some scalar lambda. So the symbol here is the lowercase Greek letter lambda. And then a scalar lambda has a, is an eigenvalue of A if there exists a non-trivial solution of Ax equals lambda x. In other words, if there is some vector for which A times that vector is that scalar lambda times that vector. And when that happens, we say that a solution to that equation is an eigenvector corresponding to lambda. So in general, some scalars will be eigenvalues of some matrices and some won't. Some matrices will have many different eigenvalues, some matrices won't. So we're just interested in when this happens and when it doesn't happen. Okay, but why do we care about this? Well, what we're going to see is that in many applications, what we end up wanting to do is multiply a matrix by a vector over and over and over again, repeatedly multiplying a matrix A by a vector. So this notation here, A to the K, just means A multiplied by itself K times. And so what we get is we're multiplying the matrix A by X, and then we multiply A by the result, and then we multiply A by the result of that, and so on. Now, if we happen to have an eigenvector when we do that, with a times x equaling lambda x, then that calculation turns out to be pretty easy because multiplying a by x just gives us lambda times x. And then if we multiply a again, a times lambda x by our properties of matrix multiplication, that's just the same as lambda times ax, that's lambda times lambda x, that's lambda squared x. And so if we multiply by a again, we'll get lambda cubed times x and so on. So this gives us a really easy way to compute this repeated matrix multiplication, which otherwise would be very tedious to compute. Okay, so how do we find an eigenvector for a given eigenvalue? So suppose that I tell you that 7 is an eigenvalue for this matrix. Now, I'm not going to tell you just quite yet how we know that 7 is an eigenvalue. We'll get to that soon. But if we know that, then how would we find the corresponding eigenvectors? Well, remember that what it means for 7 to be an eigenvalue is that the equation ax equals 7x has a non-trivial solution. So what we have to do is think about how to solve that equation, and what we're going to do is subtract 7x from both sides. That gives us ax minus 7x. But then we can factor out the x, as long as we do that carefully here. So that's a minus 7 times the identity matrix times x equals 0. And that's a homogeneous matrix equation, and we know how to solve those kinds of equations. To solve the equation a minus 7i x equals 0, first we need to know what a minus 7i looks like. So the matrix A looks like 1, 6, 5, 2. And 7i, 7 times the identity matrix, is going to look like 7's down the diagonal and 0's everywhere else. So when we do that subtraction, that gives us negative 6, 6, 5, negative 5. So to solve the matrix equation, we're going to set up our augmented matrix, which will be negative 6, 6, 0. 5, negative 5, 0. We row reduce that, and when we row reduce it, it ends up looking like this. So what this tells us is that x1 minus x2 equals 0, and x2 is free. So that means that the solutions are x equaling x1, x1, or in other words, x1 times the vector 1, 1. So this does two things for us. Because we got non-trivial solutions, that's how we know that 7 is an eigenvalue. And now we also know what the eigenvectors, the corresponding eigenvectors, look like. They look like this. Any vector that looks like a multiple of the vector 1, 1. 
So if we want to test this out, we could take the matrix A, which remember is 1, 6, 5, 2, and multiply it by any vector that has that form. So for example, we can multiply it by the vector 3, 3. And when we do this multiplication, we get 1 times 3 plus 6 times 3, that's 21. 5 times 3 plus 2 times 3, also 21. And notice that that's 7 times the vector that we started with. So this just illustrates that our solution is correct. Now if we take all of the solutions to that matrix equation, a minus lambda i times x equals 0, remember that that's just the null space of the matrix a minus lambda i. That's all of the vectors that when we take that matrix, a minus lambda i, and multiply by that vector, we get 0. That was the definition of null space. And so the set of all of those vectors that solve that equation, ax equals lambda x, that is a subspace of our vector space Rn. And so the eigenspace, that's what we call this, the eigenspace of A corresponding to lambda is that set of all solutions to that matrix equation. And that's also the set of all eigenvectors together with the zero vector. Remember, by definition, an eigenvector is a non-zero vector because a times the zero vector is always just the zero vector. All right, now we're going to prove a couple theorems about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Remember that earlier I talked about how we don't yet know how we would know what the eigenvalues for a matrix are. Typically, it's not easy to just look at a matrix and read off what the eigenvalues are. But in the case of triangular matrices, it is easy to read off what the eigenvalues are. The eigenvalues are just the diagonal entries of that matrix. So we can do the proof in general, but just to illustrate the idea, I'll show you how it works for a 3 by 3 upper triangular matrix. So that means that all of the non-zero entries of the matrix are either on or above the diagonal. Okay, so remember that what we want to do is look at the matrix A minus lambda I. Now this time we don't know what lambda is, so we just leave it as the Greek letter lambda. And when we subtract A minus lambda I, what we get is this matrix. Now we're looking for which values of lambda make that matrix equation, a minus lambda i, x equals 0, have non-trivial solutions. Well, by the invertible matrix theorem, that happens if and only if the matrix a minus lambda i is non-invertible, or in other words, singular. And when we look at whether a matrix is invertible, we need to know where the pivots are. And so if we look at those diagonal entries, this matrix looks like it's in echelon form, and it is in echelon form, as long as those diagonal entries are all non-zero. If all of the diagonal entries are non-zero, then this matrix has a pivot in every column. But if any one of those entries is zero, then this matrix won't have a pivot in every column, and then it'll be a singular matrix, which is what we're looking for, right? We want this matrix to be singular because we want the matrix equation to have non-trivial solutions. And so the way that we make that happen is by either making this diagonal entry equal zero, this diagonal entry equal zero, or this diagonal entry equals 0. And so that gives us three solutions, lambda equals a11, lambda equals a22, lambda equals a33, and so those are the three eigenvalues. All right, another theorem here, this is going to be an important one for us a little later on, and what it says is that different eigenvectors of different eigenvalues, if we collect those eigenvectors into a set, that set is linearly independent. So the idea here is that we have r distinct eigenvalues, lambda 1 through lambda r, and we have one eigenvector per eigenvalue. Now, there are, for any given eigenvalue of a matrix, there are lots and lots of corresponding eigenvectors. There's a whole space worth of them. We talked about that earlier in this lecture. So this theorem says, well, just pick one. Pick one eigenvector for each eigenvalue, throw them in a set, and if you do that, then the set you get is a linearly independent set. Okay. So in the proof, we're going to say, well, let's suppose not, right? Suppose that we do that. We find a matrix. We list out some different eigenvalues. This doesn't even have to be all of the eigenvalues of the matrix. We just have some list of different distinct eigenvalues. We pick one eigenvector for each one, and then we throw them in a set. But now we're going to suppose that that set turns out to be linearly dependent. Okay, so what does it mean to assume that that set is linearly dependent? Well, we know from a theorem we proved a while back that, that means that one of the vectors in that set is a linear combination of the vectors that came before it, of the preceding vectors. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pick out the index, the subscript, for which that happens the first time. So P is the least subscript, the smallest subscript for which 
the, that vector, v sub p, is a linear combination of the ones that came before. So that means that if we look at all of those vectors that came before, that set must be linearly independent. Because if it were not linearly independent, the one of those vectors would be a linear combination of the ones that came before. And we just assume that that didn't happen. Okay, so we have this set of linearly independent vectors. Okay, so we know that v sub p is a linear combination of the preceding vectors, so we're going to write that in equation form. v sub p is c1 v1 plus c2 v2 plus 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 cp minus 1 vp minus 1 for some scalars c1 through cp minus 1. We're going to use that equation several times, so I'm going to give that a name. I'm going to call that equation star. So whenever I say star, what I mean is that equation. So the first thing we're going to do with this star equation is we're going to multiply both sides by the matrix A. And one of the things that we get out of that is we know that all of these vectors, all of these Vs, are all eigenvectors. V1 is an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda 1. So when we multiply A by V1, what we get is lambda 1 V1. V2 is an eigenvector with corresponding eigenvalue lambda 2. So A times V2 is lambda 2 V2, and so on. So that's what we get by multiplying both sides by a. Now we're also going to multiply both sides by the scalar lambda sub p. And so that just puts a lambda sub p in front of every term. But notice the similarities between this resulting equation and this resulting equation. They've got the same left-hand side, lambda p, vp, and on the right-hand side it's almost the same. The only thing that are different is that the lambdas have different subscripts. So now what we're going to do is subtract these two equations. On the left-hand side, they're going to cancel out. We're going to get 0. And on the right-hand side, we're going to be able to do some grouping. And so what we're going to get is that the 0 vector equals c1 times the difference of those two lambdas times v1 plus c2 times the difference of those two lambdas, lambda 2 minus lambda p times v2, plus, 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 all the way up through cp minus 1. And then we factored, and we have lambda p minus 1 minus lambda p times vp minus 1. But remember the vectors v1 through vp minus 1, that's a linearly independent set. And, but what we have here is a linear combination of those vectors that equals the zero vector. That means that all of the coefficients must be zero. This coefficient here, c1 times lambda 1 minus lambda p, that must be zero. All the way up through this one, that must also be zero. But the lambda, the difference of the lambdas, those aren't zeros. This lambda 1 minus lambda p, that's not 0, because the lambdas are known to be distinct. Remember, the whole assumption of this theorem is that we had different eigenvalues and then one eigenvector per eigenvalue. So if the product of these two numbers is 0, but we know that one of the two numbers isn't 0, that means the other one must be 0. So c1 has to be 0, c2 has to be 0, c3 has to be 0, all of the c's have to be 0. But now let's one last time go back to that equation star. Now that we know that all those c's are 0, that means that vp is the 0 vector. But eigenvectors aren't allowed to be the 0 vector. And this is a contradiction. We made an assumption way back at the beginning of the proof that was the opposite of what we wanted. And when we worked through the consequences of that assumption, what we get is a contradiction. And that means that our initial assumption was wrong. That our initial assumption was false, and so the thing that we really secretly wanted to be true, that actually turns out to be true. So it's a little bit of a more complicated proof, but hopefully you followed some of the ideas. And again, this is going to be a theorem that we'll use a little bit more a little later on in this chapter.